Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. It is a Monday, and it is the start of week two for K-State, even though week one isn't officially done yet. Boston College and Florida State still have to finish things off this evening, but for Chris Kleiman and the Cats, it is on to Tulane for the most part. There were some questions and, and obviously lingering thoughts and takeaways from the game with UT Martin. You know, we we get that immediate thought process after the game from Chris Kleiman, but then you get a day in between now, and he has more thoughts to him. He's seen the game from a different angle than just right there on the field and can kind of give his insights, and we'll dive in to our thoughts and uh, what DY's biggest takeaways were from Chris Kleiman speaking earlier today. But before we do that, a good time to remind you that K-State is not going to have to wait until week one next season to start their season because the Wildcats are headed to Dublin, Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. You can join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. That means you can uh, watch K-State football week zero. You can watch your school play before anybody else in the country gets to next season. Unless you're an Iowa State fan, then you're in the same boat. You're getting to you're getting to watch them at the same time, but uh, it'll feel special nonetheless, even if you are having to share it with uh, those jabronis from Ames. So, Cats2Ireland.com is the place to go. Yeah, I know the Mitch Fortner jabroni language is rubbed off there, and for whatever reason, that's what came to me. So, let's move on from that and uh, get into somebody who's not a jabroni, Chris Kleiman, and his <laughs> week two thoughts heading into the game against Tulane. There's really a lot at play here uh, with the game with Tulane. You think about K-State lost to Tulane two years ago in the non-con. And then John Summerall, who's now the head coach at Tulane, lost to K-State last year as the head coach at Troy. So there is a lot of familiarity with the uniforms that K-State will see and the man leading the team that K-State will see. Uh, just some differences there. So uh, what is the top thing that you took away from Chris Klein today? Was it something in terms of preparing for game number two or uh maybe he he went back and said you know actually i thought we did this better or worse in, in week one what was the number one thought you had when listening to him speak today yeah they're gonna play Tulane with the coach that they saw last year coaching for someone else that being troy and then they also see the the Tulane coach that they saw but he will be at a different team and that is houston uh who by the way the most putrid Big 12 performance of the week. Did not see that coming. Yeah. Really, Fritz might be a good coach, but it looks like he's got a tall task in front of him uh, with the Cougars this year. Uh, they might be worse than last year. This must have been the way the roster kind of unfolded for him. First thing that came to mind was him kind of going in depth a little bit, that being Chris Kleiman, on some of the mistakes that he saw from Kansas State. Uh, some that you expect, maybe some that you don't, uh, you know, confusion here and there, or maybe a blocking scheme up front. Confusion a little bit times on what kind of leverage to have in coverage, and that allowed maybe, uh, even though it was an equal pass, you know, the, the receiver to get behind him at times, or the one that was converted and it wasn't explosive when they thought Toby and saw me had another sack. So things like that, but, you know, some mistakes that – I didn't anticipate hearing, and I, I don't know that I loved hearing, and and maybe it's more common than I come to think of, especially in week one was like, you know, potentially receivers running the wrong route. So uh, those were some of the examples that you heard in terms of the mistakes that Chris Kleiman saw uh, when rewatching the Kansas State games, and, and hopefully all that gets cleaned up uh, pretty immediately, obviously, but uh, it was interesting for him to kind of you know, describe some of the mistakes he was seeing that the do need remedied before they play Tulane in week two. Well, so one of those guys that that made a, a clear and obvious mistake in week one was Avery Johnson's interception. Um, we we knew after the game that Chris Kleiman came in and was pretty upfront about his disappointment in the first half with the way that the offense performed. Um, given a day in between and, and some more time to reflect, uh, what did you think of what Chris Kleiman shared on Avery Johnson today? Yeah, it didn't really go a whole lot in depth. Obviously, he was going to have his, uh, probably his first meaningful conversation with his star quarterback uh, right after we we talked to Kleiman. So probably not a whole lot to to divulge. 
other than you know that's a, that's a ball he wants back the interception um and ball, and like Avery said maybe the ball came out a little bit flat there right uh it, maybe it could have been lobbed and, and it works but there's a safety looming over the top there as well so better to throw that on the outside where he maybe has a more open receiver I I didn't get I'll just put it this way though he wasn't detailed or very opinionated one way or the other I didn't get the sense and and I didn't expect to that Chris Kleiman is overly worried about Avery Johnson's week one performance yeah and also Chris Kleiman's a pretty upfront guy I think certainly over the last three years uh in particular he's he's worn his emotion um even more like in those press settings I think and I think it all comes with just being more confident and comfortable with where he's at in his career, but also with the stage that he has his program at, where yeah, we see some of those frustrating moments. You know, like you think Texas in 2022, Iowa State last year. I mean, Iowa State last year was downright uncomfortable at times. Uh, and then obviously he came in and was very upfront about the situation with UT Martin and the offense in, in game one. I think it comes down to him trusting his roster that they can hear criticism and that they can hear praise. So he will not. Yeah, he's a little bit more transparent now than he was in the earlier years where I don't know that he could trust the roster and the culture and the locker room yeah. to be able to hear and absorb certain things. Now he's not afraid to. Like, they're not afraid to say who's starting and who's not um, anymore at times, right? Things that they would normally maybe conceal a bit more. So I think that they are, trust that they've built a locker room and a culture where they don't have to worry about hurting someone's feelings. Uh, the, there's no sensitivities here. They trust that, that they have a mentally strong, immature locker room that can handle just about any criticism, um, hard truth, or, you know, good praise too. Sometimes you don't want to build people up too much because then they stop working. So I think that's why you hear a little bit more transparency, a little bit more information divulged and why, yeah, he'll come out like he did after Saturday and says, I wasn't particularly pleased with the offense in the first half. Uh, that's probably not something he would have said, right, in 2019, 2020, or maybe even slightly in 2021 um, when I think it started to turn for the better. So the, it's a good observation there uh, to have. And, yeah, the most uncomfortable part was when he was visibly pissed off after the Iowa State game yeah. last year and, and didn't really worry about hiding that either. So, uh I think you'll have some maybe just real strong conversations with Avery Johnson, but I don't think anyone is concerned about Avery Johnson. And we're probably talking too much about it, quite frankly, all of us. We're all guilty of it. Um, he wasn't really even, he wasn't that bad. We just have these expectations already built in our head that he's going to be so special. So when he has a mundane or average performance, it's somewhat surprising. Yeah, I I, I I I understand that, and, and I do I get where that that comes from, and it's it's true. It's good to have perspective in these situations. Uh, I bring that up with Kleiman to say like, there's legitimate merit behind the fact that if he's not panicking or, or saying anything one way or the other about Avery Johnson, kind of to what you're saying, like, I, it's not like he's gone crazy out of his way to be like this guy's still you know he's he's this this and this. Like, I think he knows that people knows that, but he doesn't feel like he needs to say it to tr try and overcompensate. And it's not the other way, too, where it's, hey, we're panicking here. I think they're fine. I think they recognize that there's a lot of things that have to come together. And for the most part, I mean, it, it's, it seems like it was summed up today that they had a lot of things uh, that they wanted to, to try and do offensively or see how they could kind of work things to, out yeah. and, and do that. I mean, so what did Chris Kleiman say? in totality about the offense and where he thinks they're at and what they did against UT Martin, because I know that came up today uh, and that's already been a, a hot topic of discussion at times on the message board. Yeah. It was just a small sample size because the starters really only got 43 snaps. Avery Johnson talked about it. they like, they just didn't have a lot of opportunities uh, because they never got into a rhythm. They never got into a groove. They never got, they weren't so sharp on first down or so sharp on third down. A lot of times that, they really never got to their up tempo stuff that they wanted to. It sounded like, and that was one the second point I wanted to get to. It sounded like there was some up tempo, what they called turbo stuff that they would have liked to got to some some other stuff 
that was in the game plan that they never got to. So it just seemed like because they kind of were just kind of clunky and not sharp and all of that, that they didn't even get to some of the stuff that they really, really liked and wanted to unfold. And maybe that's a good thing that you kind of keep that in the back pocket for Tulane not to see at the end of the day. And one thing I'll, I'll mention, and I don't know if it, you know, but I think Avery Johnson threw for what about 150 yards or so in two touchdowns and, and not to say this is an apples to apples comparison and not to say that it's like you're, you're that you need to find a low bar so that you can say it cleared it. But in the 2022 big 12 championship year, that first game starting quarterback, Adrian Martinez. And I know he started out slow, but he threw for less than 100 yards against South Dakota. Yeah. And that, and that, that was one of those two where it, you know, hopefully it doesn't take a loss to Tulane to. And, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, I don't want that know, to, to be get reincarnated. You, to get you fired up and, and get you, you know, sharp and and, and like season ready like, like that. It but it does and, and play it, well against Missouri and Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. It, it shows that you can have that kind of talent and it can be in there. It just has to be fully unlocked. There has to be some belief, and I think that's what this this team's working for. Oh, ultimately, I'm not. I'm not really worried. Like. I think that there was a level of being amped up because while Avery Johnson had two games where he was basically the guy last year, Texas Tech and NC State, there feels to be there was to me it felt like there was more weight even on Saturday's game against UT Martin than there was for the Pop Tarts Bowl against NC State. That was like a like a fun thing. This is going to be really cool to see. Whereas this is the real deal. Like even though it's an FCS opponent, this is the regular season. You're playing for something. You're trying to get somewhere. This officially starts it being your time. And so I do think that there's a little bit of uh, pressure and probably high energy that went into it. Uh, probably probably no reason to make more out of it than what needs to be. But I know that it's – I mean, it's a topic that everybody's on top of and, and very interested in and uh, wants to discuss. So Yeah, it's a combination of maybe that pressure and, and amped up stuff that you're talking about. And maybe a little bit of rust because this is your first game in what eight or nine months. And on top of that, you get and I and I keep saying this, and I think this is the biggest factor too, is that he's basically playing with the new offensive line, new tight ends, a few new receivers, and a few that haven't played a lot of football, a new running back. Like there and Aver Johnson's only had one start himself. I mean, there's I warned a little bit now. I don't want it to look that clunky on a consistent level. Don't get me wrong, but I did warn, like there's going to be times through probably the first five or six games where we all look at each other and say, what the heck's going on a little bit because you can't put even, you know, talent aside. You can't put this many first year regular contributors together all at once and expect this thing to look sharp. Well, and just think about last year in the Pop Tarts Bowl, mixed resort r- results in that game. Like you, you started off, off really hot with the touchdown to DJ Giddens. They got out to what a two score lead, and then they had a little bit of a lull in there uh, in the middle part of the game, and then they finished really strong. And I think you could make that same comparison to Saturday, where yeah, the three and out to start was definitely not a fun thing. I mean, you go, oh, that's a little bit of a buzz kill. And I think more than anything, that's probably what people should take away from Saturday is they did not play overly bad on offense. They just never, they didn't do it in a certain way. And I kind of laid this out last night where, and and maybe I didn't make the point well enough, but you go and look at the comparison between last season and this season against FCS opponents. I mean, yes, last year they scored more touchdowns in the eight drives with the starters, but the eight drives this year, it's, it's because of how the distribution looked. The, the offense last year goes out, they start with a touchdown, so that's big, first drive touchdown. Then they went interception on the second drive, but after that, they had four touchdown drives in a row to finish the first half, and they were up 35 to nothing. And that's what, so then after that, you're like, okay, it doesn't really matter, your work is done. It's just about when the work got put in for the K-State offense and everything, and the final scores ended up being pretty comparable. I mean, it was 45 points last year that K-State scored in the opener. It was 41 this year. So that's the thing, too, where it's all about kind of the rhythm of the game. And K-State just had a different rhythm this year, which makes sense for everything that you said and Chris Kleiman has said, where you're trying to break in new starting quarterback, new offensive line, new weapons on offense, new offensive coordinator, new quarterbacks coach. Like, everything is new. And 
also throw in there the fact that you're trying to learn how to use the in helmet technology and what your your whole motivation and and kind of uh, operation yeah. yeah will be with that so i think there's there was a lot that went into week one i think week two now there's probably going to be a better focus on football only yeah although i will say and this shouldn't come as a surprise i think Tulane will be much better on defense than they are on offense so again i don't know if we see fantastic play out of the offense uh and i said this in the offseason i don't know if you remember you probably do you have a pretty good memory but I said I felt like the offense is coming out party because of the hype of the game and just like that moment that kind of builds up might be week three against yeah. Arizona. And then I see Arizona in week <laughs> one uh, not be able to stop New Mexico, and I feel even better about that. I was going to say, yeah, you were, were you down in Tucson this summer? Like, oh, wow, this defense sucks. Uh, I, had the, uh, I had the inside knowledge because, to be honest, I think Tulane will probably be a better defense than Arizona. Obviously, Arizona is going to be the far better offense. And and not to look too far ahead, and obviously they didn't say this, Kleiman and the players today, but kind of looking and thinking about, like, I would have been much worried, much more worried about Tulane's offense had Ty Thompson been the starter, because that meant he was probably ascending to the five-star yep. potential that he was once. But the fact that he's, you know, at best second string, but maybe third string tells me that they have real question marks at quarterback that didn't really get solved in the off season. And what I, what I will say in a new coach early, I, I don't, I think Tulane's probably going to get built up this week by Kansas State media fans, folks, everyone in the universe to be a little bit better than they actually are because yeah. of the post trip from the PTSD from 2022. This is not that team. Um, they are a mighty work in progress, too, I believe. Um, people are going to look at the, the box score of their first game, or I think it was against Southeastern Louisiana, and be like, here comes Tulane again. But, you know, they had a pretty poor first half, if you go and look at it as well. So I don't think this Tulane team is nearly as good as the one that was in 22 or 23. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. We talked about that on the Sunday show a little bit last night, kind of going over – what that game looked like for Tulane against Southeast Louisiana, who is a far inferior opponent than UT Martin. Um, and so, yeah, there, there were some things that, that went on there. Uh, there. There was basically a 10 point swing there where it very easily could have been uh, like a, a tight game at halftime or whatever, but nonetheless, I, I am with you. And, and there, I think yeah. actually their, their performance in week one makes me feel more confident about K-State going down and be able to handle Tulane. They should, and maybe Kansas State's offense will have some challenges against Tulane's defense. Don't get me wrong, but take a little bit of a step forward, and you might win that game by a little bit more than what we even thought in the off season. Because I, I could be wrong, but I just don't think Tulane's offense is going to be able to do much against K State. Yeah, uh, flipping sides of the ball. What were some of your defensive takeaways from what Chris Kleiman had to say today? I know he kind of provided an update uh, on Austin Moore, who didn't play. Uh, even the, you know the full reps that the starters got throughout the game, uh, and then some of the other things that they might have coming up. So, uh, where do you lean there? Yeah, perfect. Uh, that was you. You asked me to come up with three bullet points. That was my third. Austin Moore didn't play in the second half. Um, it seemed like they just shut him down. We knew that he was going into that game with something bothering him. So I think that they just felt that they got to a point comfortable enough to shut him down and just let what Rex man why handle it the rest of the way. And then Asa Newsom didn't play at all. What Chris Kleiman said was that the Austin Moore shutdown thing, which is what I suspected was more precautionary than anything. Um, we'll see if that continues. If, if you'll play on Saturday against Tulane, obviously this year we are talking to Chris Kleiman on Monday. So stuff that you hear injury wise, it, you know, that's a, there's a big gap between Monday and Saturday. That's, it's actually substantially more. I know it's only one day than what we got, you know, in years past when it was just Tuesday to Saturday. So things can change a lot. But I would expect Austin Moore to play. Asa Newsom probably still questionable, but he said he was much more optimistic this week that Asa would play um, as compared to last week. That doesn't mean he will, but obviously he's making strides. Yeah, that's uh, that's and, good news, and it will be kind of fascinating to see when we get our first look at him and then how they use him once he gets there. Yeah. And by the way, uh, just a little nugget here and it's something that, you know, I've mentioned in, in a bit of our writing, 
they need, <laughs> excuse me, they need Asa Newsom to get right. Um, and maybe a, you know, sooner the better. And not to sound the alarm, but like just go look at the snap counts. Like everybody is about all the starters are in that 25 to 35 range in snaps, basically, this past game, except Desmond Purnell, who was way ahead of everyone at 46. One, that's because he's a damn good football player. But two, I don't think they trust that next guy yet after Desmond Purnell if Asa Newsom isn't available. I don't think that they're going to rotate a number two in unless they feel good about that number two. And I think the only number two they feel good about at same linebacker is Asa Newsom. Yeah, that'll be interesting to, to follow along, especially because there, there's a lot of promise there with and Asa Newsom. And you don't want you don't want Des to to wear down. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, it's only 46 snaps because there weren't a lot of snaps that game. But if he's taking that high of a percentage, that means other games you're talking about 60 to 70 snaps, and you don't want that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, he, you you have to keep him available because he showed on Saturday that he he might be ready to live up to what K State fans expected and what this team kind of needs out of him to be a playmaking <laughs> linebacker for them. Because I like there are guys that can make plays, but I think there's a difference between somebody who can make plays versus being a playmaker. Des Purnell proved on Saturday that he is a playmaker. He was the best player on the football field for either team, offense or defense, and I don't think it was even remotely close. That's how good of a game he played. If that's the Desmond Purnell we get to come to expect like on a weekly basis, he should be easily a first-team All-Big 12 choice. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's take a, a look at what was the final thing that you noted from Chris Kleiman's press conference today. Uh, You kind of... I, I kind of gave you three, but I'll, I'll try to find another one. Um, some of the, uh, yeah, maybe Sam Hecht. I'll go with that one. Uh, Cause he, he was asked about the offensive line. He singled out Sam Hecht as a guy. Now I don't think Sam Hecht was the best offensive lineman, but I agree. Maybe if you're judging by this is your first career start and these are what maybe our fan coach and media expectations for Sam Hecht at center. I think he surpassed both by a lot. Um, so he is someone I thought was solid, good, you know, that first start. But for it to be your first start, you know, taking all that context and circumstances, I think that's an impressive uh, accomplishment and feat in your first game. So I would I would agree. I think Sam Hecht is noteworthy to point out as playing a very good game considering it was his first start. I mean, if, you, if you, that's your first start and that's your, like, bottom level, you're going to be a really good center at Kansas State. You're, you're yeah. starting at a pretty high point, so I really like that. Although I probably like the offensive tackles and Andrew Lang getting the most out of offensive line performances. Okay, so I was going to ask you just in, in totality, your thoughts on the offensive line good. on Saturday. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I, my takeaway is that it was pretty strong and and really wasn't noticeable, which is what you want. Yeah, as a as a unit that we kind of came in saying we need to figure out what these guys are, if they got what it takes, that stuff. They passed all the tests of week one to me. Now you have to take into account the opponent. So I, I need to keep seeing it as a larger sample size and maybe against you know power four competition or even against Tulane, who's in you know a pretty good group of five team. But they did everything I could have expected from them against UT Martin, quite frankly. And I thought Andrew Langing was the best. I thought Easton Kilty and Carver Willis were really good at offensive tackle. I thought John Pastore was pretty solid after that as well. And I thought Sam Hack was really solid at center. So those are the ones that pop out to me. I, I wish maybe would have left wanting a little bit more from, from the starting guards there. But as a whole, that collective unit, they did anything. They did everything you could have asked from them um, playing together for the first time, even if it was against an FCS club. I, I don't know that I would have been like, man, as a collective unit, they should have done more or they should have been better. It would have been hard to. They, they were that good together. I mean, just look at the stats, right? Stats don't tell everything when it comes to the offensive line. But one, there was no sacks. And... There was not even close to being a sack, I don't believe. And Avery Johnson was rarely under duress. Even he admitted that after the game. And two, you ran for over nine yards of carry. I mean, you do that, you're doing something right. But what I will say is, and I wrote this elsewhere, and 
uh, actually behind our paywall. So if you're not a member, you know, that's the kind of information that you can get. This is a little bit of a, a sample size, a little taste, is that I think it's going to be hard for them to keep Andrew Lyon getting out of the starting line. Uh, at, at some point, that's going to be a hard conversation to have. It's kind of felt like that th- that's been, you know, one of those things that, even going back to 2022, you're somewhere down the road. You're you expected Andrew Line Gang to to play a big role, and obviously now he's he's been in the program. He has the experience. He's going to be able to maybe, uh, like you're saying, make it uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, because you it's also a good gotta, thing for K State. Yeah, maybe yeah, not for yeah, know. yeah. It's a it's a tough thing because you got to take a job away from someone that maybe hasn't done bad enough to lose it. But Andrew Line Gang's just done. If he now he needs to do this more than one game, I think personally. But if he does that, it's like the one guy hasn't done bad enough to lose his job, and Andrew Lyon is doing too good not to take that next step and to get the job. You know, one of those things. Yeah. All Plus right. Uh, final thing for you. Uh, there are obviously a, a bevy of players that came, and that's also a good reminder for everybody to go and stay right here on the KSO YouTube page or go over and check it out, and you can go watch everything that you need from K-State's media availability today, whether that's the full Chris Kleiman press conference, Avery Johnson sitting down at the table, or all the other players that came by. But out of what you heard from the players, uh, what was maybe the the one thing that really caught your ear? Yeah, Avery talking about like the lack of opportunities kind of struck me a little bit. Uh, the 43 snaps, I think he was almost just like, man, I barely played, that kind of thing. So uh, that, that kind of goes forward. You know, it kind of stems from a little bit from what we heard after the game. I would just say a vibe that I get from this team and and it's a good vibe. And maybe I'm just searching for puff pieces because people are starting to say that's what I do now. (laughs) I don't think it is, but this team really comes off as like genuinely unselfish, like very, very selfless. They love talking about their teammates and like sometimes you can see that they, it's like you ask a question that makes them talk about their teammates or that they do it almost because like they have to. Like these are things that you see every year in every place. But this team like really likes talking about their teammates like in a good way. And that's why I'm starting to feel better and better about this team, even though they weren't impressive, you know, across the board in week one. But like Desmond Purnell, like when we talked to him after the game, like he couldn't, he was the best player on the football field, but he wanted to talk about everybody else. Dylan Edwards, like when he lit up the most is when he talked about what Kent State meant to him and what Chris Kleiman meant to him and getting to play with Avery Johnson and all that, like storybook stuff. Ty Bowen said he loved that when he went to block the punt, even if he whiffed, there was three other guys that would have done it probably, right? Damian Eli Leo was basically saying easy does it on Uso because the dude hasn't played a lot of football. And like it was Avery Johnson, that one press conference says DJ Ginn's the best running back in America. Everyone in here knows it, but on the national level, they don't talk about it enough. So it's like they, they literally fight for each other a little bit. When I talked to Easton Kilty today, first time I think we've talked to Easton Kilty, he like he went to bat for John Pastore, the guy that backs him up, the guy that's probably trying to take his job at the end of the day, if you think about it, right? He went to bat for him. I thought that was, you know, a cool thing. And and Brendan Mott talked about the interior guys and and Toby and stuff like that. And he's he's praised Jordan Riley before. Uh, Braden Lofton credited Avery Johnson with the read on his touchdown grab. It's just like things like that. Like more and more the vibe I'm getting is like this team would rather talk about their teammates than themselves. And I think that's honestly a really good sign. Well, you know, and I don't want to make a bigger deal about it than it is because at the end of the day, winning football games has a lot more to do with talent and, and good coaching and all this other stuff. But it does feel like this is a step in a different direction for this team. And, and not like they're, you know, trying to flip something around with the way it sets up but at least in terms of they're improving and just they're finding another area to get better in i mean this last year's team specifically i think 
it came across as there were a faction of guys that, you know, yep. they were in one camp and one was in the other. So there was some, not necessarily division, but it was, I, uh, it's, I, it's our side versus your side type deal. And we've seen that in various instances over like the first five years of the climbing era. And I think it takes a long time to kind of weed that out and get to in a position where you feel like everyone has true 100% unity. And I think that's what you have right now uh, with this team. I think, uh, Kleiman took over in 2019 and he had a good culture that he inherited from Bill Snyder and he used those guys that were tough, hard nosed, and he won eight games. And then 2020 COVID happened. Some of those really good leaders left and there was kind of like a, a group of guys that really poisoned the well that they had to basically repair. Right. And everyone knows who those guys are. I'm going to point it out. And then 2021 was kind of that middling year where you're trying to like, you're you're beyond the 2020 disarray, but you're you're climbing towards what is eventually going to happen in 2022. Fantastic locker room all over again. 2023, you feel like you got the quarterback back and all this stuff. I will say 2023 felt like a little bit like some of those final Snyder years that I covered in 17 and 18. And I post this on the board, and and maybe people aren't going to like when I say this. Last year's team, 2023, I thought felt a little clicky, mm-hmm. and that's what you just alluded to, obviously, with factions. I thought they were a team with a good culture, but it just seemed like it wasn't like one. It was this group. Yeah, the, group, some that, groups applied it in different areas than yeah, others. It was instead of one group, it felt like two or three groups. This year feels yeah. like one group again. I will say that. And you're right. More so than anything, 90, 90 to 95% of college football games will be won by coaching and by talent. The other 5%? is these little things and these little things like this are what come up in close games. So, yeah. and you're going to play in those. So it's still a really good sign to have. They got work to do, but that, that's, that's not a nothing burger. Yeah. Th- those are the things that help you win games against Oklahoma state and Iowa state last year that obviously mm-hmm. they didn't get the job done. in. so, all right, well, that'll do it for us today. If you want more on the cats, go to on three, hit up kstateonline.com because it's not just talking about what's going on with the team this year. K-State picked up another commitment, number 18 on the season. Drew and I will be back later today with a breakdown of the latest K-State edition in defensive end Brad Stanier and everything else going on over there at KSO. And then also right here, I mentioned it earlier, but you can watch all the player availability from today as well as Chris Kleiman and Avery Johnson's full press conferences. And uh, if you missed anything from the weekend, go check it out. Sunday show, player uh, pressers after the game, and also uh, the K-State and UT Martin full game highlights. So that will do it for us today. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you tomorrow with more Cats football.